Hello, my name is Sarah of the Sarah Hale Folger Project, and this is part one of my conversation with Bert Krenka. I'm very excited to introduce you to Bert, a Rhode Island icon of the arts and culture community. I will say up front that Bert has some colorful speech, and if strong language is offensive to you, be fair warned that this video contains some cursing from time to time. For over 25 years, I had known about Bert and his work starting AS220, a Rhode Island nonprofit arts organization that promotes artists with non-jury, non-censored opportunities to exhibit or showcase their art form. In other words, anyone and everyone has an opportunity to showcase their art at AS220. Bert's passion and dedication to this cause has inspired thousands of people to take a leap of faith and try their hand at the art inside of themselves. After 30 years of dedicated service to this cause, Bert has passed the baton on and now seeks after his own personal path with his art and advocacy. As I have said before, I am not a journalist and my projects are simply conversations with inspirational and interesting people. I hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Sarah Hale Folger and I'm today interviewing one of my favorite icons of Rhode Island, Bert Kranka. And we're in his studio and he's taking us on a grand tour of his incredible mind and letting us get a glimpse into his world, his story, his song of his soul. And it's very inspiring for me because Bert's been somebody that I've admired for many, many years. He's fantastic and uh, there's just such a great soul in there that loves the arts, loves humanity, loves culture, and understands the, the necessity of art for any culture to be able to thrive. And that is kind of a little, a little, little uh, in a nutshell, kind of what I think about you, Bert. Well, so. well thank you. That's very well, flattering. I don't know if I can live up to all of that. Hey, you, you already <laughs> have. <laughs> that's, that's very nice of you to say. It's always been pressing on me that the studio take a precedent in my life, wherever I've lived or wherever I live. And, and I mean, I think half the problem with people in terms of commitments to making things is that it's convenience. Mm -hmm. You have to say, our lives are complicated. I don't give a fuck who you are. Your life's a our lives are complicated, and there's a lot of tugs and a lot of distractions. For sure. So, so even with kids that are starting to make art, I say, do you have a place where you can make art? What do you mean? I said, I don't care. A little desk in the corner where your materials are out and stuff you're working on is there. So that it isn't a reset every yes. time you try to get to something. Because that can sometimes be just the thing, as simple and stupid as it is, that prevents you from doing something. Mm -hmm. So have it ready. So that's been my life. Every place I've been, every place I've lived, ever since I dedicated myself to art, there was a dedicated space in my live space where I can make stuff and make it convenient to do so, you know? I did a seven, five city, seven talk tour culminating with a keynote speech at the National Museum Conference in New Zealand. Nice. So I got a lot of the back of the house and the museums and their opening drawers, that stuff they were too too fragile and more from Maori culture to be able to display like grass skirts and these things. Yeah, that were yeah. Like, and you're, you know, and I, I'm, I get chills. Yeah. Wow. Super cool. The longest time, you know, my involvement with AS220 was 30, it's still involved, but as director, founder, director was 30 something years. There are thousands, have been thousands of doodles, and, and the reason, a lot of these are from conferences and almost like a travel log for conferences and stuff that I've been to. Yeah, or not, I totally get it. There's some, and so what started to happen is I started to resent all the time I was spending on behalf of ASU 20 at conferences and in meetings. And I said, and also at conferences what I recognize is that after a breakout thing, everybody leaves a room and they leave all the pads and pencils, hotel pads and pencils around. So I used to wait, I, have draw, <laughs> I can show them to you, I have drawers full oh, wow. of restaurant pens, I mean uh, hotel pens and pads. And I, I had this attitude, no matter how poor I am, I, I, I know how to get free materials. Yeah. Right? I, I'll never be out without materials. And then I started doodling at these conferences and everything, and it was so much, it relieved me so yeah. much because I was getting so frustrated. 
Yeah, but you hear a lot of bullshit at these places, and I learned something too, always. Uh, then they came out with a study a few years ago and said that people that doodle in meetings retain 30% more information. I was just going to say that to you because I discovered that, you know, when I was a kid, that that was the only way in a class that I could actually um, pay attention. So some of this work, these cabinets and some of these uh, mechanically animated pieces, actually if you plug this in, this this does it automatically. This thing goes up and bangs the things That's and incredible. keeps the thing going. <laughs> I think both of, both me and my wife are kind of a very hands-on makers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly use some of the digital media to do things like I'll take photographs and then project them to help make some of my artwork and things yeah. like that. Um, but we both have a feel for material and like to play with stuff, you yeah. know. Um, uh -huh. you know, and I, you know, part of my whole thinking and my wife in the same way, even though she doesn't think about it in the same way, it's just the way she's been. It's like, I've never really, even though I've made a few attempts, I don't really play well into the commercial sense of art and art as a commodity or the artist as a commodity. I don't, and, that, and the whole purpose of AS220 was put to focus more on process and mm -hmm. just people developing their creative potential and, and exactly. their voice. Um, so. Now that I'm retired, I might have to think a little differently about that and how I get my work out there and market myself mm -hmm. because I will depend on selling some work now mm -hmm. because I don't have, I've cut my income down significantly since I'm uh, semi retired, retired from AS220. Mm -hmm. I still have an association and I still have, a, I get a retainer to do some teaching and, and right. be available for consultation uh, with AS220. So, the transition out of AS20 has been, uh, I think, one of the most remarkable and responsible ways that it can be done. Cause I want to lean on my art to be able right. to produce more income, you know. So you're seeing it through a different lens now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that what your passion was in, in starting AS220 was that everyone gets a chance. Right. And it doesn't matter what kind of artist you are, performance or painter or whatever it is, you get one show, is that yeah. what it is? No, well, you can, you can get many shows, right, but, but you, you try to get, provide, yeah, you at least guarantee right. one Guaranteed a show, so, That's I mean, right. that experience for an artist, especially somebody who hasn't done it ever before, yep. is just so remarkable and validating, and, and, and just to be able to invite people in, to be in that atmosphere, is it can be transforming. That's absolutely be, right. Validating is yeah. one term, and the other, I think, also is by nature. When we're, when we're making things in our studio, it is an intentionality about around communication. We're not doing it just for ourselves, no matter what people say. Right. You know, and we always have an audience in our head. Yeah. You know, no matter what anybody says. And so you need to, I think part of the cycle of the experience of making and learning and sharing your voice is, is sharing it. Right. You know, that's part of the completing the cycle, Absolutely. getting feedback, that informing you as you right. go forward, as you continue to try to create some form of communication. Absolutely. You know? I always say that. You know, when somebody's creating, like you were just mentioning, you're creating your art, you know why you're doing it, or you even don't. Sometimes you're just creating it in the moment, and it's flowing, and you're surprised. That's you right. Know? That's beautiful. Um, and you can wake up in the morning and see it through yet even another pair of eyes. But what your intention so was, then when it gets out there for the public to view, now it's a mirror. It's no longer yours anymore because now somebody's viewing it and it's stringing, you know, it's, it's pulling on the heartstrings in the mind of that person and they're responding to it. They might have similar thinking of yours and they might say, oh, this means that or I can see this in that. But if you're standing there as an artist, and I've done this many times where I've stood by a work of art that was either mine or a friend of mine's and listened to people talk about it. And when they're talking about it, it's, it's so, so diverse. And it's reflecting them, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing. It's always thing. a projection. It's always a pro It's looking in a mirror, and it's coming back at that person saying it. So to be able to listen into that is phenomenal. And it makes the piece richer and deeper. And it, it's deeper. It's adding it's wider. Meaning. It's adding meaning, and right. where it goes, it continues to add that that's value right. to the person that's viewing it. That's what it means. They bring you put it out there. Right. That's right. It's right. It's right. It's like yeah. everybody has a different point of view. That's right. They're all valid, and they that's all right. reflect something true right. about what you just created. That's right. So, that's yeah. why I think it's a It's a challenge and a balance. I think for me, I'm a, I'm a fairly literal, blunt kind of person, and I think, and sometimes my my artwork um, is almost too literal, mm -hmm. so it doesn't give enough space 
for the viewer to interpret or to create their own narrative or story. I actually taught a class called uh, at the training school called uh, Existentialist Doodling. Oh, well, wow. I would bring in a, a, the name and give a little biographical information, some theoretical background around a particular philosopher while they were doodling, and we would talk philosophy. And these kids, existentialism is real in their life. Yeah. Every day yeah. they're questioning sure existence, and, and yeah. they're even, in some cases, their lives, are, their lives are threatened, you know? So in terms of the, the risks that they take and the behaviors that they're involved in, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times the kids will come into the class and the kids say, I'm just here because I'm bored or my buddy's coming to the class. I don't really draw. I'm not an artist. And I'd say, what's drawing? And I would go through this whole mm -hmm. series of almost Socratically que keep questioning what's drawing. Well, it's making a picture. Well, how do you make the picture by drawing? And then eventually I get the kid to say, you make marks on a piece of paper. There you go. And then I would say to the kid, can you make marks on a piece of paper? Kids said, well, of course I can make marks on a piece of paper. I said, then you can draw. So let's stop bullshitting around. I said, now, I have some experience with this. So my job is to help you have control of the arrangement of those marks to say what you want them to say. And you have something to say. Yeah. Right? You open the so door. It's, Set and free. It, but it's deconstructing, right. you know, because often if I tell the same kid what's the definite what is what does chroma mean or you or mm. uh, any of these sort of technical terms in the arts they may not know but if I ask the same kid what dual exhaust is or a carburetor he says oh, I know what that is my father fixes cars in the back of the house yeah, right? right exactly I said well it's the same thing it's just language it's just <coughs> vocabulary yeah you are more than capable of understanding the ideas and the concepts and the ideas behind all of this we just need to decode a little bit That's my family. That's my grandfather. Ah. That's me with, in the back with my hand. Yeah, take it out. That's me. This is um. This is me with my my hand on my grandfather's shoulder. Oh, Umberto, cool. Umberto. That's great. That was my grandfather. Oh. <laughs> he died young, very young. So That's I, too I, bad. I shortly after that, actually. Wow. Yeah, I was pretty young. You're, you're all looking up. You're all looking up over there. Or something. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Um. But a few things of interest, I think. This, this is a young man who was in the round training school. He had been wow. in there for about four years. He did that with a ballpoint pen on cheap paper. And I bought it off him when he got out, put some money in his pocket, gave him a couple hundred bucks for it. Nice. Um, and he's doing great. I saw him not too long ago. Wow. He jumps out of a Miller, tr Miller beer delivery truck and he said, Bert! And he gave me a big hug and That's good. said, I want you to know I'm doing really great. I got a girlfriend. I got an apartment. I got this job. I'm doing fabulous. Blah blah blah, you know. Uh, so I nice. have a I have a bunch of work that I own and have collected from uh, artists that I've met that have been incarcerated. Yeah. These things are so unbelievably remarkable. Wow. Uh, I was had the privilege through the Ford Foundation of meeting with uh, life sentence oh, yeah. prisoners in a Pennsylvania penitentiary. And what are these? How are these made? I can't tell. I mean, it's just plastic. Yeah. So they create a mold? No. No? These With are, a torch? Those are plastic forks. The prison knives. Ah! These are plastic these are plastic spoons. They're made from plastic spoons and forks. There you go. Yeah, that's awesome, right? Yeah. How cool is that? So I I met with maybe me and three or four other people. Yeah, that is a, that, You're right. That's, that's right. Nice. And magic marking pens, and this is dripped, melted and dripped. And, and Incredible. The, and you know, and I did say they let you have fire. He goes no. <laughs> you know. Don't ask any more questions. But, right, but he's but he's these were uh, a bunch of inmates in a penitentiary in Pennsylvania that worked with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Project. Nice. And they create and design murals in the prison. These guys are never getting out because it's a, in, in Pennsylvania, if you get a life sentence, there's no paroling, there's nothing. Wow. Some have been in there since they're 19, 20 years old. And I'll just get this out quick. Yeah. But oh, another part of what was a formation of my life is that uh, through the early part of my life, uh, my mother was in and out of mental institutions, you know. I literally seen my mother get carried out of the house with cops with a straitjacket, you know. Yeah. So, and she was the most loving, wonderful, warm person. Uh, but she battled, yeah. you know, and she struggled, and she spent the last 10 or 15 years of her life completely happy and insane and beat it, and beat it. Good beat, for her. Beat the drugs and everything. They were dosing her with enough Thorazine to knock down a horse. I mean, they were, it was a pathetic and pitiful sometimes to see there was abuse 
in that scenario too, mm -hmm. in them days. It was mm -hmm. so little understood. Right. Um, but to visit so as a little kid, my father refused. He'd take me and I couldn't go in. And I'd sit out and my mother would wave to me from windows and lock wards of mental institutions, you know. That's This is a large part. So when we talk about empathy, yeah. you know, and I go out to the training school and I see some kid there and I find a little bit about their story and realize that, That's it. you know, I, yeah. can, I can't do anything but be empathetic mm -hmm. and, and be heart-wrenched by the unfortunate lack of opportunity that this kid's had or the crazy shit that he's yeah, had to deal with absolutely. or she's had to deal with. You know? It makes so all the difference. It does. And like you were talking about breaking down barriers. When you're breaking down a barrier in your own mind, like your mom did, yep. it's work. It's a serious amount of work to doing that. But when you do the work, the other side of that is the freedom and that's when you you really know what you have to offer you actually are not a walking wounded anymore you you were wounded but you're a scarred healer that's you know? right well you know we all we all have a story yes we and do. we all have drama Absolutely. we all have all we all have a story to tell mine is not any terribly different than many or most mm -hmm. and and we're also privileged you know i i like i and I have, and we also have to accept these things. Like I, I pour a glass of water here. Sometimes I got friends here, and I look at the glass of water. I said, "Look at that," mm -hmm. and they go, "What? Well, right, right. I said, "I can see right through that." I said, "There's a lot of people in this world that can't pour a glass of water that you can see through." I mean, they just this, this here, right here, is a fucking privilege. That's you know, so true. It's a fucking privilege, and any assumption that this is you're taking that even that for granted, right? You know. Um, it's having a heart of gratitude. That. Yeah, that's right. where the power you lies. Is when you're grateful for yep. what you have. Yep. Yep. I, I was in an encounter group, and yep. these guys from New York and, and, and local people who were involved in the program started saying to me, you know, what what are your interests other than being a wise guy? Because you're not really that good at it, and you're not really cut out for it, right? So let's talk wow. about something else that you can aspire to be. Right, and these were coming from some pretty tough characters, so they knew what they. I wasn't about to challenge their perspective, and I said, "Oh, I, I make art because I had drawn and got a little reinforcement at grammar school by a nun, and I thought I was pretty good at it. Didn't know what the hell I was talking about." And they said, "Why don't you go to the art store and start drawing again, making art again?" And I, I went to the art store and I didn't buy anything. I left. I was completely intimidated. I didn't know what to buy. All these incredible candy store materials mm -hmm. and stuff. I was embarrassed to ask. Because I didn't even know what to ask. Where do I get started? What, what's the first thing I buy? And then I come back to, to Rubicon someday and we're in another encounter group and they say, well, have you done anything about that recommendation, the idea of the art thing? And, everything? and then I'm like reluctantly, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, and they're like, well, I said, well, I went to the art store and I... I was intimidated. I started to get anxious. My heart was palpitating, you know. And I remember that feeling to this day. And there was a woman in the program who was a RISD student who was battling some issues with alcohol and pills. And um, she says, I'll take you to the art store. She took me to the art store. And then she took me to RISD Museum, which I had never been in. I was like floored. Like, yeah. it's right here. Holy yeah. shit. These, I'm reading about Monet. I'm reading about these people. There's a Monet painting in Providence. You know, nobody told me about this shit. <laughs> so, and... So yesterday, I'm standing outside the museum with Fabio, and I said, Fabio, you know, I'm going to tell you something. He'd never been to a museum before. He's from Cape Verde. He's only been here in this country a couple of years, in spite of the fact he speaks three languages. And, but wow. I said, Fabio, I told him the story. This person took me to this place, took me to this place. I said, no, I'm taking you to the museum. You know, the implication being that someday you're going to take someone yeah. to the museum. Right. You know, that idea pay forward. Yeah. Also, stay tuned for part two of my interview with Burke Krenka.